Welcome to Bits About Books, the home for conversations with authors of breakthrough books on sales, marketing and business. Founders, entrepreneurs and individual professionals, we all need to keep track of ideas that are helping create our today and tomorrow. Bits About Books will strive to find those books and speak to their authors, go behind the scenes and understand what inspired the authors to write the books that they did and how they went about doing so. Through our conversations, we hope to gain insights that will help us to get the most out of our efforts. I'm your host Shubhanjan Sarkar, founder of Pitchlink, the next generation buyer-seller engagement platform where our mission is to make buying easy. Welcome to Bits About Books. Thank you for your time and for joining us in this session. I have a favor to ask. While you continue to listen to the podcast, please leave a comment or rating at iTunes or wherever else you get your podcasts from. I personally look at each comment and will give you a shout out to each of you in our following episodes. It means a lot to hear from you. Our guest today is Amos Schwartzfarb and we speak with him about his new book, Levers, the framework for building repeatability into your business, which he co-authored with Trevor Boehm, Cody Sims and Troy Hennikoff. Most people are data aware. They recognize that the data tells them something. But but most people, I believe, or many people go into it saying the data is going to is going to tell me something that happened versus the data is going to tell me what to do. And I think that's the mind shift. So they tell me that something happened, they're aware that data is there and the data said, "Okay, these things happened and it gave me this result." versus the data is telling me, if I look at it the right way, the data is suggesting that if I do these things, I will get this kind of outcome. And if I do these things and I don't get that outcome, I can use the data to figure out why I didn't get the outcome and what I can do differently to get a different kind of outcome, assuming that the data doesn't change. Amos was born in the Bronx, New York, and grew up in Fort Lee, New Jersey. At a young age, Amos started seeking adventure and pushing limits. While attending college at the University of Massachusetts in 1992, Amos fell in love with rock climbing which brought him to Northern California in 1993 and eventually a job packing boxes for Shoreline Mountain Project. While there, Amos helped turn an old school mail order company into one of the first e-commerce companies which launched his career into the startup world. After Shoreline, Amos went on to six other startups including Hotjobs.com, acquired by Yahoo!, Work.com merged with Business.com, Business.com acquired by R. H. Donnelly, My Spoonful acquired by the Rights Workshop, Black Locus acquired by the Home Depot, and Choust. In 2015, he moved over to the investor side as managing director of Techstars in Austin. Now, after over 100 seed stage investments including Scale Factor, Chowbotics, StoryFit, Van Robotics, Skipper, Help Burbies, Conway, DocStation and all stacks, Amos has become one of the more actively early stage investors via Texters Austin in all of Texas. Amos is also the author of best-selling books, Sell More Faster, The Ultimate Sales Playbook for Startups, and this one, Levers, the framework for building repeatability into your business. Amos still enjoys the outdoors and spends much of his free time mountain biking, rock climbing, and cooking with his wife and two daughters. Now, on to this actionable discussion with Amos Schwartzfarb. Amos, welcome to Bits About Books. Uh, and I'm delighted to have you back with your new book. Thank you for joining me. Yeah, thank you for having me back. Uh, I had such a blast last time and this is really an honor. So thank you so much. Uh, let's let's dive right in. I mean, you wrote this uh, the book about two years back, uh, which was a result of your accident and then the four months the blog posts and and that follow you i I remember that story very well and uh and the the, the book that the book i never was meant to write exactly yet yet the one you are writing for 20 years Uh, right exactly (laughs) so so yeah so uh, and that was like hitting a nail on the head which was focusing on revenue by startups uh I can see the progressional thought here, but tell me what prompted you to write a new book. 
Yeah. So, so for everyone listening, um, I, if it's okay to say this, so what we're talking about is Sell More Faster, the first book that I wrote, which is really a book to operationalize sales, like from day zero through becoming an enterprise you know, business and selling to millions and millions of customers. And the book that we're talking about today, Levers, I, I, they're, they're actually very different, although there's a common thread, which I'll, which I'll point out. Um, and, and in a lot of ways, it's a prequel to the book, but it's not a sales book. Um, the, the, the Levers is really a book. And the title, I think, does a, a fantastic job describing its intent, which is it's a, it's a framework. It's actually a series of frameworks that are meant to help you identify repeatability in your business. And the part it doesn't say is so that you can grow and scale. And as you probably know, one of one of the few handful of things that many founders get wrong, especially if they're first time founders, is they might get a little bit of traction with customers and they immediately move to scale before they really understand what is and is not repeatable in their business. And so they end up doing a bunch of things to grow before they're actually ready to grow. And so th this book is designed, it really can be, can be slotted in a few different places, but the intention of where we created it was you, you have started something, you have a little bit of traction he, here, the book comes in and says, here's a series of frameworks and they're an, an intentional progression that allow you to understand what is and isn't actually repeatable in your business and how do you figure out how to make them repeatable so that you can scale. Now you can slot it in earlier. You can start it at day zero and use it as a way to kick off and, 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 you know, figure out how do you even get off the ground and you can absolutely use it later on when you're, you know, a massive company doing hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue to help figure out how to not lose your competitive advantage. But really it's meant for sort of that middle part before you down scale. So the audience is still the startup that is trying to grow. Is, is that your primary audience still? Yeah. So, so for somewhere faster, the audience was really CEOs and sales leaders at early stage companies. The audience for this is CEOs and executive teams at companies that, I mean, really, like I said, it, it can apply at any, at any stage. And I've got real examples of companies using it at every stage, but we wrote it in the voice of talking to a founder that, you know, these are rough numbers that may be doing, you know, a half a million to 10 million in revenue, but they don't really know how to go from a half a million, 10 million to 50 million or a hundred million. So they've got something, but they don't really understand like what are the things that work and don't work in their business, which when I say it like that, I think a lot of people say, well, I do understand what works and doesn't. And, and this is a way to challenge yourself and say, do you really understand? Or do you just believe? And I think that's a really big difference is I understand versus I believe this is to take your belief and turn it into a data driven understanding. Gut versus data. That's correct. Gut versus data. So your gut is great to help guide the, the, the general direction. Mm -hmm. And then using, using our framework or our similar type of framework to drive execution against the direction. So tell me, I mean, I'll come back to the book in a moment, but tell me when you look at the founders who are using this or similar frameworks better vis-a-vis -vis those who are not, mm -hmm. is, is there any basic difference in education or background uh, that you see? Or is it like individual? Yeah, I'm, so I'll answer that question two ways. I'd say the, the founders who take to it the most are ones that believe they, they deeply in their soul under not believe but understand that that data and metrics are going to be the thing they're going to help them actually scale and grow their business. And they don't just look at it as something that they feel like they need to do because they're told to, but they need to do it because they don't believe they'll be successful without it. Um, they there are people that are open-minded to questioning everything, no matter how strong their beliefs are and being willing to be wrong. Um, and I would say those, and, and people that are willing to like really do hard detailed work, like super, super in the weeds thinking, um, working on your business. So I think that's, those are the characteristics that we see of, of folks who, um, take well to it and then it works well. And then you didn't really ask this question, but, but, I, but I think it's an important thing to point out, which is I've been running this long enough outside. Uh, I've been running this with enough companies now that in my own portfolio, 
as I, as I lean deeper into encouraging and almost, I can't force anyone to do anything, but almost forcing it on people. I see a direct correlation between the founder, the, my portfolio value on an aggregate level and the founders who are more successful versus less successful. So it's not just that there's a, there's an archetype, but it actually works and there's data that suggests that it works. Okay, so I'll just do a little more digging on this one. So the, my question was really that is it uh, founders who come from a statistical background or founders who are, b- b- because see, being data data driven is all over. I mean, everybody's talking about data, right? So everybody understands that data is a big piece of this, whatever you are doing with SaaS or any other any other company for that matter. It's not yeah. only about SaaS. So, so everybody knows that, but why is it that some people still, be, I mean, nobody questions that you need to have a payment gateway to sell SaaS, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, well, that's part of the business. So similarly, why is it that certain people will still try to do it by gut and not look at data? So that that's really yeah. where I'm trying to arrive at. Yeah, I don't know that it's, I mean, there are certain, certain people that do it by gut versus data, but I think it's a different nuance than that, which is that, there are most people are data aware Mm. they recognize that the data tells them something Mm. but but most people i believe or many people go into it saying the data is gonna is gonna tell me something that happened versus the data is gonna tell me what to do Uh. and i think that's the mind shift so they tell me that something happened they're aware that data is there and the data said okay these things happened and it gave me this result versus the data is telling me if I look at it the right way, the data is suggesting that if I do these things, I will get this kind of outcome. And if I do these things and I don't get that outcome, I can use the data to figure out why I didn't get the outcome and what I can do differently to get a different kind of outcome, assuming that the data doesn't change. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I, I get it. I get it. That's a very, very nice, uh, nice way of putting it because, yeah, so basically historical analysis versus predictive capabilities of, of data and, and, and well using said. it in real time. Yeah. Yes, well said. Well said, yeah. And, uh, you know, like in the, we talk about this in the book too, which is later on in the book, but building a financial model, I think most people who haven't built businesses before, they hear financial model and they think of it as a reporting system. We do not think of it as a reporting system. We think of it as a tool to be a predictive system, which is exactly what you said. In fact, the way, I think the way to describe it is you start your business and you've got a crystal ball, but you actually, it's all cloudy and you can't see anything in it. And if you do this well, if you build a financial model well and you use it as a predictive system, that crystal ball becomes much more clear over time to the point where unless something changes, you actually can predict the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I I get that. I get that, and and I also sort of connect back to the introduction where your co-author says that uh, Amos was talking about practically being able to see where the business is going vis-a-vis trying to go wherever they're wanting to go. So so I, I yeah. I the point. interesting thing about that, Tre- Trevor and I talk about that quote a lot because that, he's right, and I think you know there's some of this is like years of also training. The thing that that quote I don't think captures is that just because I can see it doesn't mean that we're going to get there. We still have to listen to the data. Mm. And so we are on the right path or when we're not, not if, but when we're not on the right path, we understand why and how to get ourselves back in the right direction. Fair enough. Uh, that's, 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 that's great. So coming back to the book, when, when did you actually start working on this book and, and how did that process work out? How did you get your co-author into it and so on? Yeah, so um, there, there's actually, you know, there's the main co-author who is Trevor Bame, but there's actually, there's four of us that wrote the, the book. But, um, we take the, took the main author titles just because we did all the work of editing and, and, and we work, we self-published this one and, and that and that exercise. So it, there, there's sort of a couple of things that happen at once. When I, when, when I, when I wrote, wrote Somewhere Faster and I was done with it, um, it wasn't like a terribly hard process like other authors that I had spoken to had told me it was going to be. And maybe just because I've been building businesses for so long, it felt relatively easy. But I also said I was never going to do it again um, because, you know, as silly as this may sound, writing a book wasn't even on my bucket list. So I had one and it was a bestseller and great. That was awesome. So that, that's sort of like talking out of one side of my mouth, talking out of the other side of my mouth. Um Trevor and I were already doing a lot of work with founders and all of the stuff that's in this book, like none of, we didn't create anything original. I mean, there, what we did was 
we took the things that we had been doing in business for over 20 years and we wrapped them together in a way that we felt was logical and simple to understand um, in order to be useful. And we, we've been doing this with founders um, less formally over, for many, many years. And over time, it became a little more formal, a little more formal. And there was a group of a company for, for about a year and a half through the writing of Sell More Faster, we had been you know, really sort of leaning into um, how this framework works with founders. And one day, uh, Trevor and I were just sitting and talking and, and, and I was like, hey, man, what do you think about um, you know, writing writing a book together and putting all this into one space. And Tre- Trevor has been the ghost author on a couple of books in the past, in, including a, um, a well known book called Get Backed. Mm-hmm. And uh, he looked at me and he said, "Hell no, I don't want to do that." And I said, "I don't either," but I feel like we I feel like we have a little bit of a responsibility here. Like we see this working. We're helping lots of founders, but we can help so many more. And so we kind of talked about it a little bit more. So okay, well. What if we got the two people who we thought were experts in their fields to help us write so that we're really all what we're all doing is we're just writing the chapters that we felt like we were experts in. So it's a five chapter. It's really a six chapter book. There's a sneaky appendix that we think is important, but different, but it's essentially a five chapter book. And so I wrote two chapters. Um, Trevor wrote uh Trevor wrote a chapter and a half. Cody wrote a chapter and a half. Troy wrote a chapter. And then Trevor and I did sort of the rest of the writing and the editing that goes along with it. Um, so it was, you know, basically what happened with Trevor and I said, you know, he's like, he's like, we can get to Cody and Troy to help us. Yes, let's do this. And so I called both of them up. They were both really interested. They both said yes right away. And um, we were we were sort of off from the races from there. And then the, the other thing, which uh, if it's interesting to you, we decided to self-publish this one for, for a number of reasons. Um, and it was probably the best decision that we made. And I will if if and I think I will not like write, likely write another book. But if I do, it will be a self-published book. The experience that we worked with a company called um, Scribe Media and it was phenomenally positive experience. Mm. So, so uh, before we dive into the book, tell us a bit about what happened about the self-publishing. How did you switch? You had a great publisher before, so what what really happened there? Yeah, so I'm going to choose my words very carefully. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, so, there's lots of reasons for how I think about this, um, mm. but one of the things there's a couple of things that I learned through publishing. Um, with the other publisher, with a traditional publisher the first time. One, I was never comfortable with not owning the copyright for material that we created. And um, I'm still not comfortable with that. And and with self-publishing, you own the copyright. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's like, it's just like in the music industry, the writing industry, like a bunch of things like that. It's traditionally that the publisher owns the rights, but that, that model has flipped. So that was a, a big, yeah. like original thinking behind it. Like, even with, with the first book, I really tried to figure out how to not give away the copyright, but you know, I was a nobody, so that didn't work. Mm. And then just my experience with um, how much support you actually get from a publisher. So I, I, I went into, we went into self publishing with a theory that wasn't necessarily, we weren't sure if it was true, but the theory was that the level of support would be um, somewhere between the same or better because then the way that the incentives are aligned, a publisher, you know, they only have so much incentive to push you once they make their money back. Of course they want to make money, but like once they make their money back, like that's it, you know, they've got, they've got, they've been around for years. They've they have a reputation where with, with a, with a, when you're self publishing the group that you're working with their incentive to really step up and, and, be very hands-on and help you make the best quality thing possible. And to really provide excellent customer service is very high because they're not only wanting your book to be exceptional, they're counting on you to write another book and for you to come back to them. They're counting on you to tell all of your friends who might want to write a book to go to them versus to a traditional publisher or somewhere else. And so we just found that experience to be much pleasant. What we found was what the result was we, we felt like we got, I felt like I got a much greater level of help and service even to this day 18 months after it's published um and uh and i think we got an equal to or better end product and we own the copyright great wonderful yeah. let's let's dive into the book now so you, you as you already mentioned it's it's structured primarily into five chapters and uh, they are uh, about uh, w3 which is the common thread 
uh, uh, your uh, revenue formula, which is the new one, which I want you to elaborate upon. Uh, yeah. And and of course, uh, I mean assumptions, prioritization, financial modeling. I think I, we we could talk about these these key key ones. Let, let let's start with W three. Why did you think that that thread needed to be continued here? Was it sort of to connect the two thoughts or? How was it? Yes, yes and no. And like, like, again, if you think about levers as the prequels, right? So it would come before. So with levers, you're like, okay, I'm going to figure out my business. I'm going to figure out the foundation of my business. So, so let's think about them separately for a second. So inherently, I have to know who my customer is, who I'm serving. I need to know what my business model is and what are all the, the drivers or levers in my business. That's revenue formula. I need to understand how to prioritize, which is validating assumptions. I need to understand the measure, which is KPIs and build a foundation. So if you think about the foundation of a business, it all starts with who are you serving? Who is your customer? So that, that's why it's a common thread. Sell More Faster is a book for CEOs and sales leaders. It takes it from here. Okay, we believe we know who our customer is or we need to figure it out. Now, once I know that, how do I build a sales organization around it? And so I think that's a difference. If you think about levers as sort of like overarches yeah. the business and somewhere faster is specifically fit sales up, uh, functional. Right. I mean, I, I can imagine that you can at least theoretically come up with, I mean, sales, if, if you think that levers is the horizontal bit, you have the silo on sales covered, you can then go into people you can go into uh, you know other functions vertically and, yeah. and sort of have a have a uh, entire spread of uh, books which can cover the most critical functions i guess uh, yeah forward. so if anybody out there wants to write that book i might co-author it with you but i'm not doing it myself <laughs> <laughs> it's time for a short break stay with us after the break a revenue all a revenue formula really is is the very the highest level math equation that allows you to understand your business. What's the math equation? So, you know, if you're selling, you know, uh, mobile phones, it might be, you know, number of mobile phones times number of users times cost per phone equals your revenue. Very simple. Some businesses can start that simple. Some are more complex. Where, but where revenue formula really gets interesting, it's and it's not the top line mathematical equation. Although that, you know, people often think they know what that is, and then they realize they're wrong, and it changes and evolves. Um, what really where it gets interesting is once you have that equation, and you try to picture in your mind's eye, literally a math equation, which could be, you know, three to six or seven values long, is what are the things that drive each value in your math equation? You are listening to a Business Podcast Network original. Podcasting is the fastest growing content marketing opportunity, which is untapped. We can help you craft your audio strategy and help leverage the wide reach and easy streaming capability that the smartphone penetration provides. It is easy, it is powerful and personal. Talk to us to find out how podcasting can help you build your brand and reach out to your targets like never before. Write to us at bpn at bizcast.in that is bpn at biz c a s t dot i n business podcast network podcasts end to end welcome back i'm shubhanjan sarkar your host for bits about books and founder of pitchlink the buyer seller engagement platform let's dive right back into the episode where we left it so so let's let's talk about the revenue formula so you you have a framework that you have presented in the book Walk us through that a bit, and how did you come up with it, and and how how that works? Sure. So let me let me start with the Genesis story. So I did not come up with it first. First of all, um, I learned it from our CFO at Business.com, who I think he brought it from eBay, but I actually don't know where he brought it from. He may have brought it from somewhere else. And when we we when we brought him into the organization, his name was Brian Barnum, brilliant man, um, super smart, loved working with him, probably one of the best CFOs I've ever worked with, if not the best. Um, one of the first things that when he came into that business, we had already, I, W3 was already invented and I did come up with that at, at business.com. That was already happening. And he came into the organization, he basically looked around and said, you know, he, he used the, the phrase revenue formula, but what he was really saying is, I don't understand the math of this business. How does it work? Mm-hmm. And so if you think this is, this is getting into what a revenue formula is, is a revenue, all a revenue formula really is, is the very, the highest level math equation that allows you to understand 
your business. What's the math equation? So, you know, if you're selling, you know, uh, mobile phones, it might be, you know, number of mobile phones times number of users times cost per phone equals your revenue. Very simple. Some businesses can start that simple. Some are more complex. Mm. Where, but where revenue formula really gets interesting, it's, and it's not the top line mathematical equation. Although you, that, you know, people often think they know what that is and then they realize they're wrong and it changes and evolves. Um, what really where it gets interesting is once you have that equation, you try to picture in your mind's eye, literally a math equation, which could be, you know, three to six or seven values long, is what are the things that drive each value in your math equation? And then once you have the things that drive the math, the values in your math equation, what are the things that you have to do to drive the driver? We call them sub drivers. So what do you have to do to actually move a number in your math equation? And that's where it starts to get really interesting. It's where I think the work that here is, you know, fun, but hard. And when I say hard, I mean tedious is the, the thought process to come up with literally the, you know, 50, 100, 150 drivers and sub drivers that allow you to move your math equation. And, this, when, and when you do all this, when you have this, this allows you to understand repeatability and your math equation becomes your high level dashboard for the organization and the drivers and sub drivers. Those are the things you have to need, either need to build, research, prove and measure so that you know how to affect or leverage one of your values in your math equation. Hmm. Makes sense. Makes sense. And, and, and most of the times we are potentially losing vision of the nuances which are actually impacting and getting stuck with the big number which is the top level uh, whatever we see this is what we were saying before the difference between being aware of metrics or or right. using metrics to drive something right and i think you know there's an important thing here which i go I, you know i teach this i've taught this to literally probably thousands of companies at this point and a lot of times someone will say like well i'm just a SaaS business like this SaaS business like shouldn't they be the same and maybe I wouldn't always make that assumption, but let's just say you make the assumption that two, two SaaS businesses that sell the, you know, sell the exact same thing are identical. Let's just say that their revenue formula is identical. That does not mean their drivers and sub drivers are going to be identical. They're, they're, the people in their businesses are different. The way they think about it are different. They think their strengths are different, to, different. Their weaknesses are different, different. So all of those things will be different it means that they will execute differently. So if you just, copied someone else's you're 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 playing someone else you're running someone else's race instead of running your own race which is always a recipe for failure yeah that's that's a that's a great perspective and that also short, sort of shows why in a given market certain products which are very similar to other products will sort of pull ahead of the of the rest i mean even if they're coming from behind mm -hmm. yeah yeah, they're executing well and they've used some framework, maybe this or something else, but they've used some framework to understand their unique strengths and weaknesses and the things they need to prove to do in order to impact their revenue formula. Let's jump to the, the financial modeling and then maybe we'll come back to the prioritization and the KPI bit. Uh, most people, as you rightly said, would think of financial models as a, a statement of record. Uh, how how does a especially a small company which is like starting up and 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 dealing with multiple uh <laughs> for the lack of a better word priorities uh whether it's staffing whether it is immediate revenue and so on how how, how do they actually focus on see value in financial modeling it sort of sounds like a very enterprisey thing right yeah i love i love the question and sometimes i wish i that we that we would have coined a new term for it but, it, but really, it is what it is. It is a financial model. And I think the key word here that people forget is model. It is a model of what we believe the business will look like. So that's really important, right? It's not a financial statement. It's a financial model. So the way the, the, the type of modeling that we, we teach in the book and that we encourage is called assumption-based modeling. And so if you can imagine like a really complex model, it's got like your statement of cash flow and your balance sheet and all of the different tabs at the bottom that or help you understand your business, your, your, your sales model, your marketing model, your, you know, your, your finance, um, your ops, your expenses, everything else. There's one tab that is your assumptions. And this assumption tab are all the things in your business that you might believe are true. And they might even be true today, but they may not be true at scale. They're all the things, they're all of the levers of your actual business. 
And so this one tab, which drives all of the other things, most importantly, your, um, uh, your, your, uh, your statement of cash flow, it, this one tab houses all of the assumptions that you have in your business. And you try to capture as many of them as you can through going through W3 and revenue formula and validating assumptions. Um, you try to capture as many of them as you can. And then what, the, what, when you have your model, what you do is you need to live inside it. You need to look at it every day, every week. And as your assumptions change, as they get tighter, as you learn more things, you actually change them in the assumptions tab and then it update, updates your entire model. So this is the idea that like, imagine that the assumptions tab, everything is wrong the first time you do it. And probably most of it is wrong. And it's totally normal. Right. And as you start to learn things, as you start to focus on marketing or sales or product or tech or whatever it might be, those assumptions become tighter and tighter and you update them in your model. So say like September, October, November, really blurry, the models all over the place. And then you learn something and you update a couple of the tabs all of a sudden, December, January, February, a little bit more predictable. Then you learn some more things and you, you update those things in the model. And now March, April, May, even more predictable. And you know, it takes a long time, but that's what you got to do. You have to be living in it and using it as a tool to understand what works, what doesn't work why it works and where you should spend your, your time and energy, which goes back to, you do it leading up and goes back to the, our validating assumptions exercise, which all essentially that is, is it takes all of the things that you know you need to do, research, work on, learn, and it puts it into a little quadrant, which is high and low priority, validated and unvalidated. And the first thing is if it's low priority and you're working on it, you're spending your time in the wrong place, get rid of it. You may come back to it, it may change, it may be high priority later, but it's not right now. And now you're talking about just the stuff in the top of the quadrant, which is your high priority validated and unvalidated. If it's validated, these are the things that you, that you, your assumptions are probably pretty tight and getting tighter. And if it's unvalidated, these are the things that you need to learn to see if they will even work because you don't actually have enough data. You just have a belief that they will work. These can be all sorts of things, even from, I believe we can sell to enterprise customers. Maybe, but that's just an assumption you have. How do you prove you're right? Hmm. So, so this is this is like, I, I mean, this is so critical. The, as I'm as I'm listening to you, what I'm thinking is a typical founder is thinking, "Geez, it sounds like a lot of work. Who who is going to do this? Because I've got to do those other things. I have to make those calls, and I have to do, I don't know what. But it, it looks like a lot of work. Who? So, when the the when you look at the organizations which are doing it well in your portfolio, mm-hmm. who is actually driving this? Yeah. So, so first is it is a lot of work. And we say that right up front in the book, if you don't think you're up for this, don't do it. But by the way, you probably shouldn't start a business because it is a lot of work period. And the, and the people that are doing it, it's the CEO and the executive team. And, you know, say like, I have all these other things to do. And my argument back is no, you don't, because if you're doing those other things, you're not actually working on your business or you're working on things that you believe in your gut are true, but you can't actually prove it yet. Mm. And, and and while this is a lot of work and it does take a lot of time while you're doing it, it's not like years and years of work. I mean, you're always revisiting it to make sure you're right, but you can, you know, theoretically, you could probably do all of this work in a week. Realistically, you should probably take a month and systematically go through and, and my co-authors have a business that they teach this and they do it over the course of a month and then you systematically go through everything and it's the executive team working on the business to make sure that when you're working in it you're working on the right things yeah and and just tell me when you when you again coming back to your portfolio i'm just trying to understand the real life sort of implication of this yeah uh, typically when a startup is starting up uh, it's it's a few people, right? It's like maybe three, four, five people, a handful of people. In that kind of a scenario, there is no executive team as such. So is it the founder who is driving this? What do you see? Yeah. Yeah, it's the founder and anyone that they believe can be impactful and, you know, in, in helping figure it out. And like if the team is really three, four or five, like it's probably yeah. everybody. Yeah. And, and it's, it, there's a couple of other really important things that happen by doing this exercise. So, you know, we're talking about the very tactical outputs of it. But there's a, there's a really important thing that happens every time you go through this exercise is that you, you all of a sudden get really clear alignment across the entire team because mm-hmm. the team is working together to come up with the definitions and the things you're working on. They may, you may disagree along the way, but when you get to the end, you, there, there, is, there is violent agreement 
that you, because you've done it together and you are aligned and you're using the same language and you're thinking about it the same. And it's a really important byproduct that, that comes out of it. Yeah, I can totally, totally understand because otherwise it's, well, I'm the founder and you are the VP of tech. So, you know, my gut is more important than yours kind of stuff and and i can i can totally see what you're saying yeah, right it gives them a platform to talk out those things instead of just saying i think this i think this yeah. well it, it actually forces a question why do you believe this why do you believe this and in yeah. that you can probably come up with something even better absolutely absolutely i totally see the value and i i can totally imagine when when i when i talk to small teams myself i see this happening all the time that if you are sort of I mean, it's supposed to be flat, but most most organizations have some kind of a hierarchy in some term, in terms of who has the veto and who doesn't. Uh, yeah. And 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 the one the guy with the veto can always like override everybody else, and he's yeah. essentially going through gut feelings and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. yeah. I I totally see I I totally see that. The question is, mm-hmm. when you are trying to do this, do you start with the financial model actually basically flip no. it or no the other way around? No, no, no. We wrote it intentionally in the order that we that that we believe is the right order to work on it in, with one exception, and I'll, I'll describe that in a minute. And when when uh, when when we teach it, we teach it very specifically in that order. It is meant to be a progression. So so I'll talk it through so that it makes you can understand our logic. The one piece that's a little different is that um, our appendix is a is mission vision work. We intentionally left it out of the core part of the book because the book, everything in the book is so tangible. It's all about collecting data and using metrics to drive things forward. And mission vision is a little more squishy. Yeah. That being said, we believe it's it really, everything really starts with that. And so we concluded it in the appendix to say like, okay, it's great that you're going to go through this book, but get, get with your team and like, make sure that you're all, that you all see the no- same North star. And if some of you aren't in the Southern hemisphere or somewhere else on a different planet, like you're actually looking at the same thing. Once you have that, then we can get into the work, but it is inten- an intentional progression. So it starts with, okay, I believe I want to change the, the North star. I believe I want to change the world in this way. It's great. If you want to do that, the first thing you have to do is try to define who you believe you're going to serve. Who is your customer? That's W3. Once you understand who you're going to serve, that will help you unlock your potential business model or models, which is your revenue formula. How do I think I'm going to serve them? What are, is all the things I need to do to prove that I'm right or wrong? The next piece, so now I believe I know who I'm going to serve as a customer. I believe I know what my business model is. The next piece is validating assumptions is essentially a prioritization exercise. So I have all the things that, that I could go do. What should I go, go do? That's validating assumptions. What should I do now and what should I do next? Once you know what you're going to do, the fourth piece is what are the KPIs you're going to use to measure whether or not you are going in a direction and what direction that is. And it's not about hitting your numbers. It's about understanding your numbers and understanding the why. Once you have all that, you've essentially done 80% of the work to build a financial model. You've done the hard work. Now you actually just have to go put it in a financial model. So sometimes we'll joke and we'll say, really, all this is is a sneaky way to get you to build a financial model. (laughs) <laughs> it's more than it's a lot more than that, but but you've done the work, and once you have it, you can sit down and even if you're not proficient at Excel, you can sit down and you know in a few days get a really solid model out. Yeah, that makes total sense. If you have the inputs and assumptions uh, to build build the spreadsheet, <clears throat> is possibly the easiest part, uh, and and then sort yeah. of ensuring that it is updated and and looked at on a regular basis. Yeah. Great. Uh, so. Uh, What's happening with the book since it has come out? I mean, I know there is a website. Are you are you doing workshops for for non tech star or non sort of uh, affiliated companies to come and actually learn about this? Yeah. Uh, what's happening there? Yeah. So the so the book's done great um, until recently. It was on the bestseller list for like sixteen months. So it's done really really well. And we're very proud of it. Um, Cody and Trevor have a, a business called Retro Cause. Um, I'm a small shareholder in that business, but they have a business called Retro Cause where they teach the class to anyone who wants to come in and take it. it they, they charge $5,000 a month. Uh, for They charge $5,000 for the class. The class is a month long. It's a reverse classroom. You meet um, twice a week, I think, for like an hour or an hour and a half in reverse classroom style. And by the end of it, assuming you do the work, um, you've got to do the work yourself, but you should have a... a the alignment across your team, clarity on what you should work on, and a functioning financial model. Oh, that's 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 wonderful. Bits about books is brought to you by Pitchlink, the buyer seller engagement platform. 
PitchLink makes buying easy by enabling high-quality engagement between buyers and sellers through its presentation and discussion modules. Sellers create customized sales narratives using sales collaterals and personal videos and reach out to prospects through a non-intrusive, buyer-qualified engagement. PitchLink requires no installation or download and holds the entire repository of sales collaterals and buyer-seller conversations. Talk to us to know more about how you can engage with customers without intuition. Call us on 99021-631-32. And what's, what's coming next? I know you're not going to write another book, but which book are you writing next? Yeah, uh, I, I have a few ideas, but I haven't put pen to paper on anything yet. <laughs> okay. No, going by your, your timeline, you are already due for the next one. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. I haven't started it. I really haven't started another one yet. If I did, I would plug it, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> Amos, this was wonderful as always and, and uh, very, uh, very useful. I think anybody who's going to read the book will find a lot of value if they just listen to this before they start reading it. It'll, it'll get them going very quickly. And, and yeah. I'm, I'm sure people who have already bought the book and possibly haven't started implementing it will also get sort of enthused when they yeah, read this hopefully. one. Yeah, well, I'm really, really honored that you had me back. Thank you so much. And always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you, Amos. We have a fantastic lineup over the next couple of episodes with great conversations on breakthrough books. Subscribe in your favorite podcast app so you do not miss a single episode. Thanks for listening. Thank you for being with us today on Bits About Books, where we talk to authors about breakthrough books on sales, marketing and business. We hope this conversation helped inform and motivate as we all navigate a rapidly changing business environment. For us, these are enlightening conversations enriched with knowledge and expertise. We encourage you to go out and buy the book to learn firsthand and implement some of the great ideas we discussed today. We hope to have you with us again in the next exciting episode of Bits About Books. If you liked what you heard, Subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast platforms like iTunes, Google Play, Spotify or wherever else you get your podcast from and give us a rating while you are at it. This BizCast original podcast is produced for PitchLink, the next generation buyer-seller engagement platform where the mission is to make buying easy. Hosted by Subhanjan Sarkar and produced by Rajiv Aditya. See you next time and have a wonderful day.